I'm Jackie Ikyama and I'm delighted to be here today to talk to you about um, a major uh, health emergency which happened in Galway uh, 100 years ago, just over 100 years ago, um, i.e. the flu pandemic, the influenza pandemic of 1918-1919. So I'm going to focus specifically on, on Galway city and county in, in, in relation to that, um, but I want to talk in, in general terms about the, the background to the pandemic how it originated, how it got to Ireland, uh, and then to focus in specifically on the, its impacts here in the west of Ireland. So to begin, um, I just want to say, profess at the outset, I'm not a medical expert, <coughs> indeed, excuse me, nor am I an expert on um, the flu pandemic itself, um, to the degree that many of my other colleagues are. Um, and my route, I suppose, to looking at the pandemic really came about as a result of other research uh, I was undertaking um, on the whole area of child welfare in Galway. Um, in the course of research on the history of the Galway branch of the National Association for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, um, or the NSPCC, to give it its more proper name, um, it, two things quickly became clear to me. Firstly, uh, the high degree of poverty and neglect and insanitary conditions uh, which pertained in large areas of the west of Ireland. And secondly, the enormous impact of the flu uh, pandemic on a population already struggling uh, with the aftermath of the Great War, um, a war in which, uh, as many of you will know, m a great many Irishmen uh, played a, a very active and significant part. There is no doubt that the flu pandemic of 1918-19, uh, uh, which lasted from February 1918 until April 1920, was one of the deadliest pandemics in human history. It infected 500 million people worldwide, about a third of the world's population at the time, in four successive waves. Now, Ireland experienced three um, uh, waves, discernible waves as such, rather than four. And so it was pretty much gone from Ireland um, by, by April of 1920. But nonetheless, it did continue in, in peaks for three specific peaks uh, during that time. The death toll is typically estimated to have been somewhere between 17 million and 50 million worldwide and possibly as high as 100 million. In, 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 in the Irish uh, situation, the, con the consequences of it uh, were, were, were stark. And they were stark because of the circumstances, as I said, that had pertained in Ireland at the time. But in statistics, just to look at it from, the, from a Galway perspective, between 20 to 25 million people, as I said, worldwide. But of that, 800,000 people in Ireland caught it. And of that, of that total, uh, 23,000 uh, died. Um, interestingly, there was a geographic spread as to how devastating the, the illness was. Ulster was, was very bad because it was a centre of troops re returning home uh, from the war. Um, Connacht was very bad as well for the same reason. With the notable exception of County Clare, which um, has almost completely escaped the, 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 the epidemic, only 0.46 per thousand deaths of its population, whilst County K Kildare had the highest death rate again unsurprisingly because of the location of the current military camp so there's a very strong connection between the pandemic and the war and and where the the, the pandemic um uh, originated uh, one point uh, that i do want to emphasize however and it's known to most of you i'm sure at this stage in that the covid 19 pandemic that we're dealing with at the moment um, tends, as we know, to, to focus uh, its more devastating impacts on the older cohort of our population. That was not the case with the 1918 uh, uh, pandemic. It actually conversely affected that generation, that middle generation. 22.7% of the influenza deaths in Ireland were of young people aged between 25 and 35. And that had very, very stark consequences because it meant that that generation that had survived the war, certainly the, the young men who had come back safely from the trenches, were hit with a double whammy that many of them, the fittest and healthiest of the generation, were the ones who succumbed. And clearly down the road, that was going to have major implications for demographics, but also for, in many cases, as I will show later, um, for the children left behind, um, many of whom lost not just their father, 
but their mother as well and there was a huge problem with the amount of orphans that um, that originated uh, or that had to cope with the consequences of the pandemic so I talked a little bit about the fact that it, it originated um, in the trenches um, of World War One it actually its exact um, origin is, is unclear, but certainly there seems to be a very strong sense that uh, it came, it was originally identified in May of 1918 in a, a, a camp, a US Army camp um, in the United States. From there, it traveled to Europe, um, where it tended to increase pretty rapidly in the in the pretty grim conditions of the trenches. These are soldiers heading off the 10th Irish Division, uh, uh, heading off from Basingstoke at the beginning of the war. Um, but you can see the accommodation even at enlistment was, was, was tense, rather cramped people living in very close quarters. That, of course, deteriorated rapidly once they got to the trenches. Um, and both sides were very much impacted by the harsh and insanitary conditions which pertained something which was in, in, in exacerbated by exhaustion, by tiredness. And those the two images I show you here are of on the left hand side, um, a, a British trench with soldiers trying to take some rest between battle and on the right hand side, a German uh, army trench. Very similar. The men are exhausted. They're shattered. Um, they're dealing with adverse weather conditions on the right. It's, it's, it's snow, as you can probably make out. So in those conditions where there were animals, there were horses, there were dogs, there were rats, there were cats, there was all sorts of animals. And it, there's very definitely a, co a, a correlation between the virus itself um, and animals, that it, it originated in animals. Possibly, they think, uh, with pigs, um, which supplied meat to that army base in, uh, in the US where it was first uh, identified. So to look at the three waves of the pandemic as they as they occurred in Ireland, um, it's very there are three very discernible uh, waves. Uh, we can see there the first one I mentioned it had originated or first identified in May of 1918. By the summer of that year, here in Ireland, we're seeing two very large points uh, originating. This is Belfast and Dublin. Um, uh, Belfast is the blue line, and Dublin is the red line. And you can see very clearly here um, by June um, of 1918, there's a peak there um, in June of 1918, the summer of 1918. It then tapers off during the winter and there's a second rather large spike then uh, in November, December uh, of 1918. Um, and it again tapers off again, but it re returns in the spring of 1919 and there's another deadly wave of it. Um, in terms of its, its um, um, the death factor, um, the first wave was a relatively mild disease um, obviously significant deaths, but nothing like the second and third waves, which were infinitely more lethal uh, and caused the vast majority of deaths uh, from, from the pandemic. So those are the sort of the statistics. Um, um, the symptoms of the first flu, as I said, were quite mild, um, as indeed we, we are told COVID-19 is today. A mild type of, of, of illness. Um, the, the first or milder flu were lack of energy, aching pains, rising temperature, an unstable pulse, sore throat, headaches, loss of appetite, and gastrointestinal pains immobilizing a person suffering from the disease. The second wave was a much more virulent form of the virus. It may indeed have mutated, but it was certainly more, more virulent. Um, and in many cases, some of those, the, the symptoms were quite shocking. People got sick very, very quickly. They went downhill rapidly. And um, a, a, a rather scary and frightening feature of it uh, was the fact that people became very black. Their faces became very black um, um, and 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 they really went down, they dropped very, very fast. So it was a terrifying illness that could come on in the morning and by the evening the person would be dead. It was so rapid. The onset and development of the disease was so rapid. Now, the, the peak that I mentioned to you there in November was very much associated with this, the armistice of November 1918. Uh, much as today we're told that large gatherings of people will precipitate infection, it was exactly the same in 1918. And whilst the first wave had passed, by the time we got to 1918 and the joy that people experienced, this is a, a scene in London, but the same scenes were replicated throughout Ireland. This is a scene in Dublin, a victory parade in 1919. 
seen. So people were gathering to celebrate the end of the war. Understandable. They were delighted it was over. Um, but the consequences of those gatherings, um, that lack of social distancing, as we'd call it today, were that more and more people became infected. So to bring it more locally um, uh, bring it back to, to, to Galway, as I mentioned, um, levels of poverty, levels of um, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> unsanitary conditions were rife. And so this is a situation which I think exacerbated the situation uh, in Galway. But it was very much affected, adversely affected by the fact that there had already been a typhus outbreak in 1913, which had very badly and adversely uh, affected um, the, the population of Galway, uh, particularly in Connemara, where conditions were as I say, very basic, very a, a, a very large um, shortfall in terms of medical help and, and, and uh, assistance um, conditions were primitive. Um, it was also an area where there was a great deal of poverty. The land was not good. It was beautiful, but the land was not good. Um, and so people had very little reserves. So if somebody did get sick, to get a doctor to come and, 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 and tend to them was actually very difficult from a logistical perspective just to get people, but also having to pay for medical care, to pay for medicines, to pay for warm blankets, etc., was very, very difficult. Um, and the conditions of those families, there were large families living in cramped conditions, which of course meant that once the disease got into a household, it was very, very difficult to get rid of it. Um, and many, many families in large amounts succumbed uh, as a unit. So the mother or father would be the first to, to die and one by one the children would, would, would succumb. If they didn't, then they were orphaned and people were reluctant to take in the orphans of a family where, um, where uh, the mother or father or both had passed away. So there was a huge problem uh, brewing down the line for families uh, um, in terms of the, 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 the innocent victims, if you like, who survived but did not survive uh, with their parents. So uh, just to come back to some of the, the, the stark statistics, I suppose, that underpin this, um, in my work on the, the history of the Galway NSPCC, um, I, I put together some statistics for you on, on the period immediately before the pandemic, 1915, but after the typhus uh, epidemic that, that had, uh, had, had run through the district and caused untold deaths and distress. Um, in the Galway NSPCC, in that period, they dealt with 770 cases. Now, these are just notified cases. There were probably many others that they didn't actually get to, to hear about at all. Um, and um, I use the term offenders because that's what they were called in the report. But in many cases, poverty was the biggest offence um, and people didn't have a choice. So you can see there overwhelmingly the one thing that came out of that the nature of the complaints, abandonment, ill-treatment, assault, exposure for begging, none of that was remotely comparable to the issue of neglect and starvation. So clearly poverty was at the root of the, of the grip that this, um, this disease uh, took on Galway once it arrived. Um, this is a, a quotation about the uh, about the typhus uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, the areas around Carraro, Gorumna and Letter Mullen have once again been hit by the disease, which is often spread by lice, fleas and rats. The scale of poverty and misery in this Irish speaking area has long led to claims that it is suffering from immense official neglect. Over the last 20 years, six young doctors who dedicated their lives to working to alleviate suffering in the area died from illnesses contracted in the course of their duties. Now, that's really significant because it meant that once the flu took a grip, particularly on Connemara, um, it was going to run through the place because there was nobody to stop it. There were very few doctors. Uh, many of them had already succumbed to their efforts in trying to stem, uh, stem the typhus uh, epidemic. Um, so they were not fit and not ready to take on a second wave of, of, of a lethal uh, disease. So when it came um, uh, to, uh, to, to Galway first, uh, it came via Ballinasloe. That's where it's first reported is in Ballinasloe in June of 1918. 
Um, and um, it's called the Spanish flu and they talk about it as the Spanish flu. But just to be clear, it didn't originate in Spain. The reason it's called the Spanish flu and they talk about it here in this uh, extract from the Connacht Tribune as, as uh, in Spanish uh, had the severe form of the influ of influenza in Spanish cities. So it became known as the Spanish flu. The point about that is, of course, that it was in all of the combative armies uh, involved in the conflict, the, the German, uh, the uh, Italian, the, the British, etc., the American, uh, French. And at the same time, they did not want, from a morale perspective, to let that word get out. So there was an embargo on talking about it. It was there. It was impacting on troops directly. But the, the, the authorities did not want that to get out. So the only country that was experiencing it, that was neutral, was, of course, Spain. And so Spain began publishing in its newspapers accounts of this disease. And as a result of that, word eventually spread uh, to the more mainstream media. So it was it, there was an official policy of not talking about it from an army perspective, but it leaked out via the Spanish press. And of course, it then became known as the Spanish flu. So it was notified um, in Galway in June of 1918, as I say originally in Ballinasloe very much because I, I think it's, it's it's almost a given that it was because of retu returning troops coming from Dublin to the army barracks in Ballinasloe having brought it with them um, so um, we're told in the in the article um, the latest information is that it has laid its grip on Ballinasloe our correspondent sends a dra graphic account of what he describes as a mysterious malady uh, which has prostrated over 40 soldiers and 20 civilians and from which two shop assistants collapsed behind their counters. In some cases, whole families are stricken down and one doctor while driving his motor car was attacked with the malady and is now confined to bed. The doctors are baffled as to the nature of illness. As if to give point to his narrative, the correspondent adds that while writing his dispatch, he was speaking to a young man who 10 minutes later became suddenly ill and was removed to hospital. So it's a very scary um, account there in that first account of, of it arriving. Um, and people were, 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 were a bit at a loss to know what to do to address it. Um, so um, they, people were told to take precautions by adjusting their clothes to the vagaries of the weather, by keeping their windows opened and living as much as possible in the open air. All solid advice, as we know. Um, uh, and it was just a, 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 a grasping at, at some sort of straw to try and figure out what to do. Precautions are still necessary for the malady has by no means run its course. Bed and quinine appear to be the two great safeguards. So again, eventually when it got to, to, to Galway, um, precautions such as, as quit bed and quinines uh, were, were, were the, the advised, the advised uh, uh, treatment. Um, as I mentioned, because of the war, it meant that many doctors were at the front and there was no national health service. So people had to do the best they could. The, 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 the image on the right is of a Red Cross nurse, uh, many of whom did absolutely heroic Trojan work in, in stemming the disease. And in the fields, the men and, and factory workers did their best uh, by wearing masks to try and prevent uh, the, uh, the infection. Uh, whilst the local and national newspapers reported on the unfolding spread of the epidemic on a local level, it was from the minutes of the various board of guardians uh, that we get a sense of a rapidly evolving situation and one that is without precedent. And that becomes apparent. One such instance occurred at a Galway Board of Guardian meetings held in November of 1918. In the district of Lettermore, uh, it was stated that the local guardian observed that they were unable to procure a doctor, nurse or sanitary officer. As the meeting was in progress, the minutes record that a telegram arrived at this juncture from Mr O'Gorman, district commissioner, stating that 200 people in, Le in Lettermore and surrounding district were stricken with the epidemic and they had no doctor or nurse. The chairman observed, this is serious. Can something be done? Dr. O'Brien, based in Linan, undertook to step in and cover this district as well as his own. But he asked for 15 guineas a week, stating that if he was obliged to continue acting for more than one week, he would deal leniently with the board. A number of things are clear from that comment uh, by Dr. O'Brien. Firstly, uh, Linan is over 51 kilometres or 32 miles from Lettermore. Uh, and the roads between the two districts were extremely poor. 
Secondly, Dr. O'Brien was already dealing with over 200 influenza patients of his own and had himself been stricken with the flu, which was a common enough occurrence at the time. But although he was, and I quote, and he was not well himself for a week or so, he attended the people who were stricken down and was still night and day on the road. Um, perhaps uh, not significantly is the re reference to the payment of additional monies to Dr. O'Brien, something which became an increasingly contentious uh, issue uh, amongst the Board of Guardians throughout the West as they struggled to pay the cost of employing additional staff where such staff could be found and were willing to take on the work, and many of them indeed were not for obvious reasons. Um, the Chronic Tribune of the 9th of December 1918 reported that the recent meetings of the various boards of guardians in the county, quote, the expense which the epidemic had incurred threatens to fall heavily on the ratepayers. In Uchtharard Union some weeks ago, a substitute for Dr. Hearn, who was also a victim, was appointed at the fabulous fee of 15 guineas a week. Owing to the continued illness of Dr. Hearn, the substitute has been requested to reduce his fee. So there was huge pressure um, on, uh, on medical staff and without the, um, the uh, efforts of volunteers like the Red Cross um, staff, etc. and volunteer nurses, um, it would have been impossible to continue. Um, people were requested to protect themselves by protecting their own health to avoid contracting it, which indeed is common uh, and very solid advice today. Um, <clears throat> And uh, in November of 1918, Dr. Kennedy O'Brien of Uchtharard reported that he was dealing with 200 cases and requested that a nurse be immediately appointed to assist him. He said that the epidemic was abating in the town but spreading in the country districts. So again, we're talking about an increased um, amount of, of um, uh, nursing staff and, and uh, medical staff falling victim. Um, because of the fact that many of them, as I mentioned, were away at the front. So during the, this is a quotation from the Board of Guardians report, <coughs> excuse me, during the past few weeks, a large number of flu cases were treated in County Hospital Galway. Among the victims to the epidemic were some members of the nursing staff. Two probationers who were on duty at the Union Hospitals had to be recalled from that institution to cope with the extra work. So again, they were falling victims. Medical frontline staff, as we'd call them today, uh, were, were amongst the earliest victims. Um, and nurses in particular were very vulnerable because of the nature of, of the, their, their direct contact with patients. Um, so, um, again, the idea of, of, of people having to reduce their fees and being paid money, um, it had to be paid for. So the, the, the physical and the human uh, um, uh, victims of this, including medical staff, were one thing. But there was a huge economic uh, nightmare for many Board of Guardians who had never experienced anything like this before. They had to pay a premium for medical staff who wanted to work. Um, and this became a, a bone of contention, as you can see. Um, uh, yeah, before I move on to the next slide, uh, just to come to, to give a broader context, in Mayo, an increasingly desperate uh, Dr. Francis Ellison, the resident medical superintendent at the Castle Bar Asylum, uh, reported in early December 1918, and he and I quote, for the past 10 days, influenza in a more virulent and intensified form has stricken down the staff and patients. So this is the second uh, wave. Up to this, this moment, close on 100 male patients and about 30 ma female patients have contracted the disease, while more than four, four, three, fourths, uh, three quarters of the staff are laid up and are wholly incapacitated from duty. One of the female night attendants, uh, 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 14, sorry, um, 14, uh, uh, sorry, pardon me, I'll, I'll begin that again. One of the female night attendants has this morning, I regret to say, passed away. 14 male patients have so far lost their lives, chiefly from the result of septic pneumonia, and many others are dangerously ill. With nearly 150 patients ill and with less than one fourth of the staff available to look after them, not to mention the supervision of 800 inmates. The committee will recognise the tremendous difficulties and dangers that have to be faced by the few of us who are left to do our duty. So it's an extremely um, a trying uh, uh, experience for those people trying to work in those conditions. Um, 
the death of, of some nursing staff um, is, is clearly another element there. Um, no, he, the, the doctor subsequently said that nurses were nowhere to be had. Those of the staff who have so far resisted the disease are making extraordinary and highly commendable efforts to carry out the impossible. One week later, three more nurses uh, had actually died uh, and Dr. Edison himself survived uh, to live and, 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 and lived until 1941. So um, with reports of deaths um, um, in Mayo and in Galway City and, and parts of East Galway, um, Connemara, as I said, was very badly affected. And um, when reports of influenza reached the poorer Irish speaking districts of Connemara, the resulting panic was entirely understandable, given that just five years previously, the area had been badly hit by a deadly outbreak of typhus. The areas around Carraro, uh, Gorumna and Latter Mullen have had once again been hit by disease. Um, by November 1918, Lettermore was very badly affected with over 200 cases and no doctor or nurse, and it proved impossible to recruit anyone willing to take up the positions. Um, the terrorising effect of the epidemic was how it was described in the local press. Because of fear of infection, friends, relatives and neighbours refused to help with the removal and burial of victims and police often had to be called in to do the work. Because of the memories of the recent uh, typhus epidemic, which was fresh in people's minds, the fact that the temperatures of some influenza, influenza patients has had, quote, risen as high as 104, which is abnormally high in ordinary influenza attacks, led to the belief in Connemara that the outbreak was, quote, a combined form of typhus and influenza. So there was a real fear that this was just just the typhus returning, but in a more virulent form. Um, now, as I mentioned um, in, in, in that uh, excerpt from the, the local press, um, the fear of infection was such um, that in the majority of cases, uh, victims were removed to the workhouse, uh, with the result that by December 2018, uh, sorry, 19, December 1918, the Galway workhouse housed up to 200 uh, inmates, approximately of 100 of whom were flu victims. In the districts of Barna, Spiddle, Moycullen, it was stated that orders for three or four interments per day were received for the graveyard in Barna, which had seen 16 internments in 10 days, which represented quote, the total interred previously over a considerable number of years. And that's a problem which is is, is, is replicated throughout the country. This, the sheer, sheer volume of, um, of deaths meant that, you know, uh, graveyards and, and burials uh, became a major problem because it was a major pinch point. They literally couldn't bury people fast enough. And they were, um, to quote uh, Dr. Ida Mellon's book, stacking the coffins in order to wait their turn to, to be buried. For those victims who died at home, um, the question of internment became highly problematic as fear of infection took hold of family, friends and neighbours. Reports in the Connacht Tribune uh, recounted in horror the story of one woman from Rosseville who lay dead in her home for four days. When workhouse personnel arrived to remove her from her cottage, the woman's relatives refused to help them. The men had to travel back to Galway and return a few days later when the woman was finally removed by workhouse personnel and moved to Galway for interment seven days after her death. So there were shocking cases of that replicated uh, around the country, but they were particularly uh, uh, common, unfortunately, in, in, in Connemara districts where people were quite understandably te terrified that they were going to become infected. In another case of a stricken family in Bailadangan, uh, a family of four. Uh, when one member of the family died, neighbours, quote, this is from the newspaper, uh, declined to assist in the interment of the remains, which was carried out by the local constabulary. An outraged board of guardians responded that the relatives should be buried for refusing to assist in the interment. How did they expect priests or doctors to attend such cases when they refused themselves? But there were those who were quite, who were happy to help or willing to help. And amongst those are the extraordinary Dudley nurses. And this is an image uh, of a Dudley nurse visiting a family uh, in Connemara. Um, their conditions were absolutely extraordinarily difficult. Um, this is some quotations from the, the Connacht Tribune. Sometimes working 48 hours on end, these nurses have to battle with wind and rain and all the powers of darkness. Sometimes when their patients live on islands, 
uh, to wait for hours before the wind and waves will let them embark. Um, so it was extraordinarily difficult and they were dealing with rough and very remote terrain. Uh, this is another quotation. Um, they are called up far into the mountains. They must wade through streams and jump from boulder to boulder to avoid marshy ground, marshy land or climb up rough steep paths, often with the risk of losing their way and have to wait till guidance comes. Despite all this, life after life, which might otherwise have been lost, is saved by these nurses who bring succour and comfort to the sick, whose utter ignorance of proper treatment of disease and accident prevails in these remote regions. Um, the consequences um, of, of, these, of the treatment was, was, were severe, as, I, as I've mentioned. Um, it, 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 due to, to the fact that it was young people who were affected um, in the main. Um, this is just one snapshot of the Connacht Telegraph of the 9th of December 1918. Three obituaries in Castlebar and, uh, sorry, there were 33 uh, obituaries in Castlebar and District. Um, in, the, in the first one, Katie Gavin, Miss Rainey and Miss O'Byrne were all nurses in the asylum that I mentioned earlier on that had been treating huge amounts of, of, of ill people. Brother Bernadine O'Connor was another who'd been uh, giving uh, uh, succour to the sick, uh, visiting them on their deathbeds and performing uh, uh, funerals uh, and also helping to bury victims. So he succumbed to the illness. Harry Dwyer, only 18, the son of, son of a shopkeeper. And that's, that's a very important point. Many shopkeepers, because they were in direct contact with people, they were very in the service industry they were amongst the first people to succumb um, and that was a classic example of one in, in the case of harry dwyer george waters a county council employee he had been involved in the removal of, of bodies from houses where nobody else was prepared to help mrs ainworth a, a, a widow died leaving eight children who were subsequently uh, um, orphaned john mongi an excise officer his brother a student had died in just the previous week John McGing, 30, only seven months married. Pat Dolan, left a widow and 12 children. Paddy Marr, a member of the congested district board staff, again, who'd been involved in caring for those who had died and, and, and giving them a decent burial. And finally, Josie Irwin, a national school teacher. So um, we're talking about, uh, about the, a task where where not just the frontline staff, but everybody involved in, in trying to deal with this pandemic were pushed to breaking point. This is a quote from uh, the Connacht Telegraph. In the Castlebar workhouse, which now accommodates three unions, the military supplied Red Cross vans. In Castlebar town and district, the priests and doctors worked nobly in combating the disease and their task was no light or pleasant one. Only two members attended the last meeting of the asylum committee. So the people, tasked with managing it were really struggled and struggling to do so. Dr. Ellison, the resident, resident medical superintendent I, I referred to earlier, stated this institution is passing through a crisis without parallel in its history. Um, and again, I mentioned uh, the brother who, who passed away there. Many priests also uh, succumbed to the disease um, and the speed at which that happened was, was quite striking. Um, Reverend Stanislaus Faulkner, the curate of Letter Frack, um, this is how he met his end. Quote, even the members of his family were not aware he was sick. Out night and day, attending to victims of the epidemic, he overtaxed his strength and sick unto death, he retired to bed at midnight and passed away in the early morning. And that is very typical of the scenario. People literally uh, dropped uh, very, very, uh, very, very quickly. Um, I think it's it's important to, 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 to take on board the fact that, that it was a majorly new dimension uh, to, for Board of Guardian members financially to be dealing with, but also from a logistical perspective. And they were, some of those who did attend meetings and were active were very infuriated by those who didn't. Um, and to make sure that infection was not precipitated in the community. So this exchange uh, happened at a, a local Board of Guardian uh, members uh, who failed to act to ensure that flu victims were transported to the workhouse promptly. Quote, they must be queer guardians who represent the district seeing as they don't take any interest in the case. They are so afraid of the disease that they don't like to go near it. It is very inhuman. Why do they want to be guardians of the poor for if they don't act as guardians of the poor? 
which was a not uh, unreasonable argument to make, I think. Um, this is an image, and there are very few images of people actually suffering from the disease, obviously to protect their privacy. So this is one of the few images I've managed to find, and it's not a staged one, it's not a recreated one. This is a, a scene in, in the United States where this little girl uh, who's here, her, her sister is the woman in the bed, and the parents were already dead. Her sister was trying to cope with the rest of the family and um, she was concerned about her older sister and this tiny little girl here who's crying um, went and got help and when the, the, the help arrived this is the scene that they saw and somebody uh, took the photograph. Um, now I, it's not clear whether this, this woman in the bed uh, survived but certainly the little girl did. Um, but it just goes to show how rapid the descent into disease was and when it came to treatment uh, of the disease Several reports refer to the fact that in the first uh, three days of the illness, all the patient was advised to take was milk. But even that became problematic with the Galway Board of Guardians finding grave difficulty in securing a reliable milk supply owing to the influenza epidemic in the families of the contractors. So even in farming circles, people were so ill that they couldn't actually even milk cows. So there were shortages like that. Um, but I think for all the logistics of managing a pandemic of this nature, it is the uh, community already war weary and still reeling from a typhus epidemic. It is in the human tragedy of individual cases which still resonates in the folk memories of local West of Ireland communities. Both the local press and, and, uh, and in local folk memory refer to the fact that the influenza epidemic represented the loss of a generation. One newspaper lamenting, quote, a sad feature is that most of the victims have been young men and women. So it is that lost generation aspect that I referred to earlier. Um, and many of these men and women uh, who had married and had families, their children became orphaned, as was often the case um, when both parents died of the disease. Um, and it is a fact also that the practice of having a wake following um, a death um, precipitated even greater infection and that was one of the reasons why um, they were dissuaded from doing so but it was very hard to get that me message across. Um, one really tragic case that I came across uh, was in Thurlockmore, County Galway in November of 1918 where quote the doctor, father and mother of a Thurlockmore family were buried on three consecutive days. Um, so it is it is awful and there were there was cases like this victim um, Paul Philip MacDonald of Tum, a very famous MacDonald family in Tum. He died of influenza contracted on his honeymoon um, in October of 1918 um, his, and the newspaper reported that quote his offices in Galway were crowded in presence which he never had the opportunity of seeing. Um, he had spent his honeymoon in Belfast and had contracted it there. One interesting and sad, uh, uh, okay, another victim was, was a local journalist who went out to report on the pandemic um, and we're told a pathetic double fatality is the deaths from pneumonia of Mr. J.J. Hoban, Milltown, local representative of the Western people and his, new, and his wife. Mr. Hoban succumbed on Friday night and his wife, wife died on the following morning. They had only been married a little more than three months. The late Mr. Hoban was a familiar and popular figure in the local press circles. It was very pathetic that these two young people who had only been married a short time should have succumbed almost together. The influenza scourge was sweeping the country, uh, as indeed it was. Um, uh, before I move on to that slide, I just want to share one other story about a family um, from Corundulla called Lardner. Um, on the 19th of April 1919, it was reported that a Mr. Lardner, his wife and five of his children were ill with the disease. Dr. Cusack reported that the father and a baby were dying, the five children were sleeping in one bed and it was necessary to climb over them to give them attention. The nurse in attendance was doing her work fairly well. The people were very badly off. <coughs> Both parents subsequently died within days of each other in April 1919 and the surviving two of his children had also become ill, leaving seven children very bad with influenza, three of them suffering some septic pneumonia. A nurse from Galway was employed to look after the children in their own home. 
The family had, it, we were told, quote, only four acres of land and a cow, which must be sold to pay for the burial of the parents. The children had no one to look after them but their grandfather, who was over 80. So this is a tip, a story that is very, very typical uh, of, um, of, 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 of the flu pandemic as it un unfurled. Um, but in every disaster, there's an opportunity. And uh, there were those who were, um, they were, who were uh, uh, shall we say, um, not losing an opportunity to, 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 to make a few, a few bob. So um, it was very common to see advertisements advertising not just medical cures or supposed cures or treatments for the influenza, but in this case, a butcher's saying that medical opinion says it is absolutely necessary to eat the very best meat as a preventative of the flu. You should therefore get your supply from Fallon, who buys the best beef and mutton that can be got in the market. My meat cannot be excelled. And they basically tell you, you know, that's, the, that's, that's their marketing ploy, you won't die. Another one is a champagne cure, something that might be appealing to people. Of course, it didn't hold any water, but um, this is a, an advertisement, a cure for influenza, major au gourmand. Sure me doctor said a glass or two of dry champagne will do me good. Be gara, the bottle's dry enough by this time. So this is the kind of advertisement uh, that was common enough at the time with people trying to sell their wares in the teeth of a pandemic. Another advertisement was uh, for um, cycling, you know, buy a bicycle if you're healthy and fish you won't catch the flu uh, which isn't a bad piece of advice either I suppose but um, that was common enough but it did have a very major impact on the economy because of large gatherings being dissuaded markets uh, local marts and markets and, and fair days were cancelled um, and in the case of this advertisement from the Castlebar Bacon Factory, it states that owing to the staff of the bacon factory being down with influenza, the management has been unable to kill pigs this week. That obviously had a knock on effect, not just on the supply of, 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 of uh, pork products, but also for suppliers who now had no market uh, for their produce. But there were also um, those who did not succumb to the disease and actually survived. And there were numerous prayers and thanksgivings published in the Connacht Telegraph and other, and other newspapers. This one from June of 1919. Thanksgiving to St. Rock for a miraculous escape from influenza and it in the house. So there were many of them like that. St. Rock was, was the, pa the, uh, the patron saint of disease and many people refer to St. Rock uh, uh, in that regards. And indeed, Knock Shrine was never busier. And we were told uh, there that there were never such crowds seen in it since the early days after the apparition. Many went to give thanks for their deliverance from the influenza plague and the threatened conscription scourge. So there's politics and medicine being mixed here, uh, the, the, the conscription uh, threat of 1918. They'd escaped that and they've managed to escape uh, the pandemic as well. Um, but there were other conditions uh, that were being neglected. So there was a concern that because the focus was on the, 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 the pandemic, that other diseases were actually going untreated. So tuberculosis was, was an incredibly uh, virulent uh, disease throughout uh, Ireland at that time. And the tuberculosis, tuberculosis officers uh, report here from September 1919 is pretty clear. With the present inadequate scheme of finance and organisation, the difficulty of rousing the public to the danger and the lax control of public health by the sanitary authorities, it is impossible to check consumption, which is on the increase owing to the recent influenza pandemic. So, um, as you can see, um, it was very much a case that um, there were there were other um, elements, I suppose, to this pandemic, um, and. Amongst the most poignant um, um, legacies, I suppose, of this is is the sheer devastation on individual families and how that was commemorated. This is a memorial um, um, notification in the local paper uh, for a family called Cunningham. The first anniversary in sad and loving memory of our dear mother, M Mrs M Cunningham of Cara James Belcara and her two sons, Patrick and Thomas, whose young lives were so tragically ended by influenza on February 20th, 21st and, 20, and 23rd. 
and they talk about that from their 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 broken hearted relatives but if you look at that this this is mary cunningham she died uh, aged 57 dies on the 20th her son patrick dies on the 21st and the second son thomas on the 28th so that's a, a family typical of many where there was wide scale and intergenerational deaths caused uh, by the by the pandemic and um, we're told also here in, 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 the, in March of 1919 in the Connacht Tribune, quote, the influenza has wrought terrible havoc from recess all along the villages south of Mam Turk to Mam Cross. Scarcely a house has escaped and in some as many as 10 people are confined to bed. Derry Mean School has been closed since the 1st of March for the, first time, for the third time since last October. All the men in Mam Cross police barracks had to go, had to, go to hospital and the post office was also attacked with the disease. It was a deplorable sight to see these poor people knee deep in mud and marsh carrying a corpse for half a mile for burial. So it's it's a, a very um, it's a very uh, stressing, stressful time for people. Um, the lack of scientific knowledge and clear government advice left the poor open for unscrupulous theories and 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 uh, and uh, uh, paranoia, I suppose, about where this had come from, how bad it was going to get, what the potential cures were. So there was a lack of information and leadership. Um, and people turned in many cases to, to prayer and to the church. Um, and there were people were, uh, were told, for example, in the cathedral in Tum to quote, say 10 Hail Marys and 10 Our Fathers each day for the abatement of the scourge in the parish. But there were others for whom um, uh, disease and, and, and disease spots were the ones to be avoided. And this was marked in this, this uh, uh, um, extract from the Connacht Tribune again, about the islands of, of Connemara. Practically all on the islands became afflicted with the influenza, poorly fed, many succumbed. And this is the important point. No spring work has been done and a correspondent asks who is to sow the potatoes? Who is to pay the rent or to feed the people for the coming year? A callous government does not heed their cries and its departments in Ireland profess themselves incapable of dealing with the problem because they do not possess the money and the treasury will not grant it. Ireland contributes millions each year in taxation, yet these plague spots are permitted to exist. This is the sort of government from which the overwhelming majority of the people of Ireland are anxious to break away. So we see here that all of the conspiracy theories etc that had adhered to the uh, to the flu um then began to take on a political dimension and this is another example of where the british had not uh, treated ireland fairly had done what they did in the famine and allowed people to die in misery for lack of money and lack of care <coughs> excuse me so <coughs> what you see here is that starting to sag into um, the war of independence, which of course uh, had already started at this stage, but now this, it's getting a boost from this pandemic. Um, because people were now subject to um, um, all sorts of quarantines and uh, when there was, there was, they were prevented from going out at night, there was curfews in, in place, the disease actually did abate, as we know, uh, after the spring of 1919. Um, but it was replaced by yet another uh, major uh, civic uh, uh, unrest in the form of the, the War of Independence on a country that had already been hammered and particularly so uh, in, the in the Galway region. Um, so if we look at, at, at um, uh, I won't move on to that one yet, um, I think in terms of its legacy in, Go in County Galway, in areas already poor and deprived, conditions worsened. Um, we've seen the, the comments about there about a callous government not heeding the cries of the people. Um, so it meant that even when the epidemic had been brought under control, there was still a price to be paid in the west of Ireland and in Ireland as a whole. Um, the fact that people didn't have a new generation to plant, as is mentioned in that previous quote, plant the potatoes, to sow the seeds and to look after the children meant that there was a lurking disaster and a catastrophe uh, waiting to happen. Um, and I wanted to, to begin uh, winding up uh, the, the lecture by, by, by just sh sharing one image with you that always struck me very much. This is a lady, not a Galway woman, she's a, a Dublin lady, Catherine Heatley Nemoran. Nee 
Um, this is a, a photograph of her on her wedding day and it's a rather disturbing image because she literally looks like the child she was. She was only 16. She has her little uh, bouquet of flowers on her blouse there. Uh, she was married in 1910, widowed in 1916 when her husband was killed at the Battle of the Somme. In 1918, she died aged 24 in Dublin's liberties of the Spanish flu, leaving behind three young sons. Um, it's a very poignant image and it just says to me um, two things. Number one, that that generation who succumbed um, had already endured so much with the war. But it's the people left behind that really have to pay the full, uh, the full price, I suppose, of the devastation wrought by the, the flu pandemic. The three children uh, of, of uh, Catherine Heatley being amongst them. So therefore, I want to conclude by returning uh, to uh, the, the people I, I spoke about at the earliest, uh, to the youngest and most innocent victims of the pandemic of 1918, 1919, uh, the children um, who came to, to, to my attention initially. I already re re referred to the case of the family of Lardner, um, um, seven of whom were left orphaned as a result of their parents' death. And that the, their story is typical of many at the time, with no relative other than the eight-year-old grandfather I, meant, I mentioned earlier willing or able to take care of them. Um, the family's fate was sealed. Once they had recovered from the flu, the family was broken up. The boys were sent to St Joseph's Industrial School in Salt Hill, Galway, and the boys and the girls, sorry, the, the, the and the girls were sent to St Anne's Orphanage in Taylor's Hill. They never lived together as a family again. There were so, so many orphans in a similar uh, position and, and the trauma endured by them, um, I think is one of the reasons why people simply didn't talk about the, the flu uh, pandemic for many, many years. And it is fortunate that um, Dr. Ida Millen, who's written a wonderful book called Stacking the Coffins uh, on the pandemic, she managed to interview one of the very, or some of the very, very last survivors of that time uh, or did oral history interviews with them. And it's from those that we get a sense of how traumatizing it was and the devastating consequences for those left behind. So the effects of the influenza pandemic were felt for many years and many generations after the last patient had recovered. But in many cases, the flu pandemic itself and its impact was banished from folk memory because for many, the worst disease of all in the stricken west of Ireland was poverty, for which, regrettably, there appeared to be no cure. I'm going to finish on that point um, and say thank you for sticking with me. Um, um, uh, thank you, Merry Christmas and stay safe and well. I'm sorry I can't answer your questions, uh, but hopefully if you have any questions on the pandemic, um, I would heartily recommend Dr. Mellon's book. Thank you.